uh, people are going to be joining us. We don't have a full group here yet. Um, so uh, let's bear with us for a couple minutes um, before we get this formally started. I'd like to, you know, we have an agenda. Uh, Pete's going to uh, uh, present first, followed by Francis. And then we're going to talk about subgroups. Um, I did want to grab some, I would kind of like go through the list and, and, and take attendance um, at some point. It's just, I think it's a bit too early. So let's just give it a couple minutes and then, and then hopefully our co-chair representative Zulo will be on the line. If not, we'll get going uh, in advance. I should ask um, both Pete and Francis, are you gonna wanna be taking control uh, as a presenter uh, for, on this or, uh, you know, uh, do, you have, do you have slides or anything that you, you plan to show? Uh, yeah, David, I, I have slides so I can just, you know, become the co-host or something during my section. So I don't know how that's, I don't know if that's Alex, Ashley or some, you know, whoever up. does that. They can do that. All right, well, it's 11.03. Um, if I could just start really briefly, I'm just gonna, I can see people here, but I might as well ask at, at the same time rather than try to do. So Sean, I don't think Sean is on the line. Uh, Bob Maddox is on the line. Um, Josh Lacar. No, Caitlin Palmer, yes. Emmeline Harrigan, yes, I saw you, yes. Barat Gami, no. Pete, yes. Gloria Guvea, no. Uh, Carolyn Nastro. No. Frank Taylor. Don't know. Um, Leslie, you're here, yes. Uh, Pete McGinnis. No. Marissa Mead. No. Philip Chester. Nope. Todd Dumay, nope. Sandra Neeson, no. Matthew Mandel, yes. Did I have that right? Yes. Uh, Stephen Kleppen, yes. Benjamin Wenegard, yes, yes. No. I thought I saw him before. Uh, Greg Ugalde, yes, 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 um, Francis, yes, okay, well, okay, so I'm, um, this is our group today, uh, thank you, and, um, I think at this point it might be just best to turn it over to Pete. So if he could be given, uh, do I give him? Um... It's beautiful. Yeah. You should have the ability to. Um, yeah, I think um, I'm ready to. Uh, let me let me share my screen here. Um, Okay, can, can folks see that? Uh, yes. Slide screen? Yes. All right, David, so yeah, I'll, I'll get started here. 
everybody. I'm uh, Pete Harrison. I'm a director of Desegregate Connecticut. Uh, and I guess I have about 15 minutes to primarily do a kind of 101 um, overview of what form-based codes are, um, why in the context of Connecticut, they potentially could be a really helpful community tool. Um, and then at the end, I'll lay out um, some potential next steps for a, a final deliverable of this working group, which would be uh, what we discussed, kind of like a guideline document for, for towns kind of at different scales and sizes. So that is what the um, intention is today for folks on the call and for, for listening around in the public. So very quickly, Desegregate Connecticut, we are a pro-homes coalition of over 80 nonprofit and neighborhood groups across Connecticut. We believe that better zoning laws can lead to a more sustainable and equitable state. Uh, we focus both on um, motivating folks locally to get involved on planning and zoning commissions and also for state level action. Uh, and we have really an all of the above approach to solving um, the problems of land use in our state. Um, and one of them that we are really attracted to is this idea of form based codes, which I'll uh, talk about now. But before I want to get some context established here, of I think why we're all here, why this is an important issue at an important time. And that's because Connecticut has an affordable housing crisis. Um, Almost 40% of Connecticut households, whether they're homeowners or home renters, are considered cost burden, which means they're paying over 30% of their income towards housing. Um, tack that on with a typical Connecticut household of paying almost 20% for transportation costs, and that's half a family's income or individual's income out the door. Um, that is insane. Uh, that is a destabilizing amount of people that are vulnerable in our state. Um, that just can't stand. So we have to do whatever we can to address this. Um, part of the problem, not all the problem, but part of the problem uh, that folks are so cost burdened is because we don't build enough homes. Um, we are third last out of all 50 states. It's only Illinois and Rhode Island are uh, building fewer homes than ours, whether it's single family homes or multi family homes. Um, that is, um, also part and parcel for the problem of Connecticut really over the last 20 years, going back to the even during the Great Recession. So we are at a deficit already, um, significantly made worse, of course, by COVID. Um, but that's kind of the state that we're, we're in here. Um, part of the reason we don't build enough homes is the model of conventional zoning that we use now um, across most of the state exclusively allows single family homes on large lot sizes as of right. Um, part of our work is putting data behind some of these um, statements and 81% of our residential land in Connecticut that's zoned residential requires almost an acre of land. That purple C that you see of Connecticut is every zoning district where single family housing on large lots uh, are allowed as of right. Conversely, other kinds of homes and buildings are either not allowed at all um, or they must be approved by special permits with onerous requirements, either um, large parking uh, requirements or sizes, um, septic tank, whatever that might be. Um, conversely, on our zoning atlas, this is the 2% of residential land that allows multifamily housing as of right. So that's a pretty stark contrast of land use patterns um, in our state right now through conventional zoning. Um, and really under conventional zoning, and what I mean by that is the kind of structure that we have in Connecticut of um, local planning and zoning commissions appointed or elected. Um, they tend to be populated by older, wealthier, wider homeowners at the expense of other types of residents, um, broadly speaking, and they have discretionary right over um, most of the zoning code and land use policies in the, in the, in the town. Um, what this really means in practice is a small amount of people who can make it to a planning and zoning meeting um, or, or have the time and capacity to join a planning and zoning commission, they can veto the kinds of development that our state really needs. Um, and they can do so really project at project, which can be really easy to miss the forest for the trees as not recognizing the larger uh, systemic problems that you have as a community or as a state. Um, we see this, of course, in really contentious fights across the state going back 20 or 30 years of um, you know, folks denying applications for uh, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's market rate housing, whether it's infill. Um, this is just unfortunately a very contentious process 
um, that tends to um, result in things not getting built that, that we want to get built where we want to get them built. Um, and really the core problem that we've identified and others certainly have identified about conventional zoning is that it excludes many people. If, if you are not older, whiter, or homeowner, um, you tend to be underrepresented, certainly on the commissions themselves, um, but even to be able to attend these meetings and have your voice heard um, in this context. That really um, leaves a very unrepresentative amount of voices in a given community, uh, making decisions for certainly current residents, but obviously for future residents. This also has a negative outcome of really producing pretty arbitrary results. There is the code and the zoning regulations in a town, but because there is such discretionary power at the planning and zoning level um, that a developer, a homeowner that wants to improve their property, um, people that aren't homeowners or property owners really have a hard time navigating that. Um, and it really can come down to a kill point of a couple of people showing up um, and opposed to something, most people not knowing about it. So that can be really hard to navigate from a uh, property owner and from a developer standpoint, and certainly just from um, a, a residential standpoint. And really what, what the consequence, of course, for all of us is this arrests growth overall and arrests the kind of growth that we want to see. Um, and this just really is not equitable. It's not economical and it's certainly not sustainable from an environmental standpoint. So that's really the context of where we are right now. Um, and that is partly why Connecticut is barely growing. Um, over the last census, um, a couple of states were losing population, um, Connecticut barely grew. So we know intuitively that our population is not growing, we have a huge drop in school age population. We are aging as an overall population. And a lot of that is because we're not building the kinds of communities that that type of an audience and demographic really needs to thrive. So this is where we get to the potential alternative that we're here as a working group talking about. Um, Form-based codes provide a local approach that is by definition more inclusive, more predictable, and more appealing to all community stakeholders uh, in a given community. Um, I'm gonna reference a couple of the towns and cities that use this model already, but this is an example. Canton uses this for Collinsville, which I grew up about five minutes from. Um, so we'll reference a couple of these plans throughout the day. So primarily form-based codes prioritize defining the physical form of buildings and the surrounding streetscape, uh, rather than relying on the more conventional zoning method of limiting use uh, or separating uses of residential and commercial um, and limiting what land use can do in terms of those particular use cases. So this really prioritizes focusing on the minutia of what a building looks like, what a street looks like in context of a broader part of the community. So this is an example from the Collinsville plan um, of a hypothetical building that um, communities had input in of what that feel and look um, would demonstrate in this sort of mixed use nature and the walkability nature that's inherent in this model. Um, so these models typically re-establish or frankly re-establish the classic kind of main street feel of mixed use, multimodal, you know, biking, walking, uh, development that many of our cities and towns, our most beloved communities across this state, were originally built around. Um, these are not new ideas historically in, in Connecticut or, or frankly across the country. We lost sight of this in the 20th century as highways and cars became the dominant um, you know, actor in the built environment. But this model really in a lot of way goes back to that classic New England character that I think we all love and value. Um, this is an example of Hamden, Connecticut, that has a form-based code. Um, I don't know if this is wrong along uh, Route 15, um, but this would be an idea, again, of going back to a more classic walkable, um, gentle density view within the existing footprint of what is now largely kind of large parking lot services and, and strip mall kinds of environments. So this process gives people in the community the opportunity to envision the future look and feel of their community while also planning importantly for the future needs of its residents, businesses, and a natural environment. So rather than reacting at the project by project level of conventional zoning, which can really cloud those, um, those voices and ideas, this process starts at the beginning at the community level to really get that input and that outreach effort. Uh, this is an example of Simsbury Center that's done 
um, a, a similar model of laying out um, everything from you know the streetscape to what kinds of building structures are in place based on an immense amount of community outreach over a, a certain period of time. So this process is inclusive because it asks the broader community to proactively consider what's it want at the community level and not at the given property level. I keep making this contrast that we currently live in a, in a system where the project comes before the board, people can comment on it, um, rather than thinking about what do we actually want in our community, having a space and time and input from other types of voices um, to think about the current needs and wants and the historic needs and wants and the future needs and wants. Um, I love the whaler sat in here, so I wanted to show that. But this is a process over time of outreach, of um, providing visualization and education to communities, having different meetings. Um, you know, language outreach is important for this, depending on the community as well. But it's built over time to get feedback from people that typically can't make it to planning and zoning meetings to have that input put in place. Uh, this process is also predictable because it lays out the pre-approved designs of buildings, of lots that a property owner can comply with and get approval for uh, as of right, um, but also on the back end, the residents know what they're getting because they've envisioned what they want to look like. They're not going to get um, some kind of strip mall CVS. They're going to get something that is um, already in compliance of things that they want in that particular lot at that particular time. Uh, this is an example in Windsor um, of a particular site that they used, giving a, a sense of um, what are pre-approved design models? What are the sort of context of all those design models together? What that looks like at the street level? That bottom left is a use table of different checks of what types of uses are approved, how different functions of the building and the lot size can play within context. And this is just a sort of speeded up version of this use table. Uh, and this is an example of a streetscape. Uh, and, and sort of defining more characteristics of walkability that's kind of inherent in the model. Um, this process is also economically appealing because it controls the cost of the property owner rather than having to face this kind of arbitrary um, unknown process. They can easily comply with it uh, and proceed. This provides new revenue for the municipality. Uh, we've got all kinds of studies at Desegregate CT from Connecticut and elsewhere about the economic um, improvements related to this model and how it generally can um, and creates and encourages more types of uh, economic growth. Uh, and it also provides just more walkable homes, uh, more obtainable services for a wider range of residents that are not car dependent, um, whether they're younger or older or disabled. Um, it provides a lot more dynamism for these communities. This is just another example uh, of Canton of really getting into the minutia of setbacks, of property line, um, of different sort of internal uses of the, the particular lot that's again, pre-approved. So a developer and architect can come and look at this and say, great, let's, let's use this particular model and we'll get approval and we'll go into construction. Uh, just some other examples, I believe this is from Simsbury of a couple of different use cases. Again, the important thing and I'm highlighting this is the scale um, is, is locally driven by the needs and the interests of the existing community with still a bias towards knowing that we need to grow and have more walkable communities. And this is you know, a, a healthy tension there that produces these outcomes. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, there are six towns and cities of very different sizes and demographics that use this model currently. Canton, Hamden, Hartford, Manchester, Simsbury, and Windsor. They've all incorporated form-based codes into their zoning regulations, either across the entire municipality or in certain special districts. Um, so we already have a lot of resources and experiences to draw from that I think can inform um, some of the next steps for our working group. These are just examples um, of some of the plans. I've got a link I can share this presentation with that links to all these plans so we can kind of go through them over time. Um, but finally, you know, if adopted more widely, I really think that form-based codes can be part of the state's toolkit to address lack of affordable housing, stagnant economic growth, and the increasing risk of climate change. It's not a be all end all. That's not the intention of the model or the intention of advocating for it, but it is part of this all of the above approach to solving the housing crisis um, and um, you know, providing communities more tools that they can um, dictate their future in a way that's more inclusive. Um, I wanna close by just saying, of course, there are challenges with the model that we need to be upfront about. Um, it is a technically complex process. This is really, again, getting into the minutia of 
how tall a building is, what the setback is, what the use cases are. Um, so whether it's at a particular district level or the municipality level, I'm almost sure that all of these plans were developed by professional consultants, which um, is almost a necessity given the complexity of this kind of design process. Um, and also the, the nature of the outreach process, which is just as important. Um, it takes a lot of time and cost to produce these plans. Um, the intensive nature of this outreach effort is a good thing. All of that work and pressure um, up front is the idea that once you get down to that minutia project level later on, a year from now, two years from now, it is a smooth process and things can be built that the community wants much faster. But it is upfront a, a significant time and cost um, process. Uh, and then finally, and an important part of this too, is just the training uh, on compliance and enforcement, both for town managers and planners and, and planning and zoning commissions. Um, there is an element that these kinds of plans, if they just live on a shelf, um, they won't be used or folks won't have the technical skill to kind of read a plan and recognize that and help uh, developers and architects go through it. So there needs to be um, a, a, a specific um, emphasis on the training and compliance and enforcement overall. Um, so I just want to close by saying, I think our working groups will suggest a couple next steps um, towards delivering this kind of guidance document. Um, number one, I think we should hold discussions with model actors currently using this of these six towns, um, talk to the town officials, commissioners using this model. We have a great selection of these six communities um, that can speak to a lot of the different use cases across our 169 municipalities. We should talk to the professionals who produce these documents, um, planning consultants and otherwise uh, to get you know a good sense of the scope and scale of the projects and what's worked in Connecticut. And certainly we wanna talk to residents in these towns that have participated in this process um, that live within the, the zoning regime of these processes to see what uh, the opportunities and challenges are. Second, I think we should conduct reviews of the plans particularly emphasize the outreach process. The more outreach that's done up front, the more community members you get in front of, the better this plan would be. So we wanna understand what worked as strategies for best practices. We wanna recognize what categories of building types are out there. The idea could be based on um, what we understand about the different communities in Connecticut, we could really put together a, a, a subgroup of different types of models of classic New England architecture mixed use buildings that could be easily pulled in these plans for developers to track that makes sense at scale for the community. And finally, too, we want to have a better sense of streetscape. I know Francis, I guess, is speaking about some of this after. Um, but again, getting a sense of best practices of how to de-emphasize parking, de-emphasize speed and safety, uh, multimodal use cases, we can get a good sense of some of these plans in action already. Um, both from the planning process, but also the execution process. Finally, this would lead to outlining best practices. Um, we can establish outlines for various scopes of projects, again, be it a city, be it a rural community, be it a special district, be it uh, the town wide. We've got some um, models to use and case studies to review. We should collect statewide standards for building and streets, as I talked about. Um, and also, third, I think we should create an intermunicipality dialogue on these models. We should talk to these six uh, cities and towns and get them talking to other folks that might be interested in this to figure out what are some choke points early on in the process and what kind of resources potentially the state can provide um, to fuel this process. All right, so that's that's it on my end. Um, as I said, I can share this presentation. I've got links to these six plans um, so we can reference in the future. Pete, thank you. And, um... And, and I think sending sending the link would be very very helpful, and I I would I would guess I uh, would like to maybe spend a few minutes before we shift over to Francis for some for some questions maybe five minutes. Um, so if, uh, if anybody wants to raise their hand, okay, Bob. Yeah. So and part of this, uh, thank you very much for that, Pete. Um, that that was very informative. And part of this is also maybe back to the general group because I admit I'm struggling a little bit with what our end product should be. So when I looked at the enabling statute, it was as a legislature tends to do a little bit of everything. So this is my understanding and, and maybe sometime we have to correct it is that one of the main goals is to make recommendations to municipalities on model codes that can adopt that will make housing easier to build and more affordable. That's, I don't think it's the only 
thing I would hope, I would hope also it would be more sustainable and more resilient. So with that, Pete, what I was just curious to know, since we have, it's great that we have six towns doing this, um, I'm gonna put Hartford to the side because we know that Hartford is a more affordable community than the other five. So in the other five of, Candon, of Canton, Hamden, Sidsbury, Manchester, and Windsor that have actually done this, is the housing that they have done more affordable? Where they've done this for base zoning? Is it worked in those communities? And if so, how much? Is it 5% more affordable? Is it half the price or, or what? Yeah, I think that's a great use of our, our time as we review these plans and talk to these, these planners. I mean, that's certainly one of the intentions of this model. Um, as you said, too, sustainability is another one. But yeah, I think that's a great use of our working group. Okay, so you don't know if this for, the utilization in those five suburban towns has made more affordable housing. I, I understand it could make it look more like a cute New England village, and I'm all for that. Um, uh, you know, from there. The only other point I would also add, and you kind of touched on it earlier, and I saw with your maps because I kind of cringe when we put these maps up. We sort of have three types of Connecticut in the sense we have rural Connecticut. I live in a little town of Bethlehem. We have suburban Connecticut, i.e. say a Hamden, a West Hartford, and we have urban Connecticut, you know, Hartford's, New Haven's, Bridgeport's. Urban Connecticut has an infrastructure that allows for aggressive development because they have on-site water and septic. The other end is rural Connecticut, a lot of Litchfield County, that you have to have uh, your own septic system that costs a bloody fortune. I'm putting in one now. It's it's unbelievable what it's costing now. And uh, you have to have your own site water. And sometimes that requires an acre or two of land because of health code issues and soil types. So I sort of bring this up that any solution would come forward is probably gonna have three legs to it to address the three types of Connecticut we're dealing with. And, and with that, I'll let others ask questions. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and we have not done an analysis of the existing plan so far um, I, I'm not sure if others have, maybe, maybe Sean, you guys have, but um, I think it's, we have data on what some of these plans have done elsewhere over time, uh, but I think we can look into um, some of these specific areas as well. I don't know if my mic is on or not. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Leslie. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, uh, I, mine was off. So Leslie, thank you. So a couple of, um, first of all, Pete, great job. Um, just really great job. I am, I have a couple of concerns. One is that um, when we talk about building types, I, I think that's a little bit, we, we need to be very clear about what we mean about building types. And I think it is a mistake for it to be about design. I think the point of form-based code is that it is about form and there's a distinction between the two. Um, so if you look at um, one of the very, very original and I think gold star um, standard of form-based code templates is the, um, is the uh, DPZ smart code. It's very simple. It doesn't talk about style, which by the way, is not, it's not legal to regulate style. And the difference between style and design, I think is very murky. Um, so I would caution everybody about that. Um, and restricting architectural design to New England type buildings, I also think is a mistake. We would all be living in, um, you know, caves and huts if we restrict creative design. I think there's a real place for creative design and it can still fit within form constraints. And I think that is the, the real beauty of um, form-based code is that you can still have, that you can still implement the things that make for great streets, um, in some places, buildings close up to the sidewalk, in some cases, buildings further back with certain elements, allowing encroachment, things like that. Those are the things that actually, regardless of style or design, make a place great. Now it doesn't, 
Um, it doesn't guarantee against bad design, but nothing will. Um, yeah. Particularly clients. Clients can be um, can push for the ugly like I've never seen. Um, but the other thing is, it also doesn't guarantee affordability. So Hamden, I did the Hamden code just so that everybody on the this uh, Zoom knows. Um, you you have somebody here who has done this, and in the nitty gritty, not you know I had consultants in the beginning, so um, I can talk about a lot of lessons learned. But that aside, the issue of affordability. Yes, it's about having. Um, it's about ha increasing the availability of housing and housing types. It is also about where you don't have enough affordability. It, it's about things like A30G. Um, and I, I think that's a critical piece of legislation. We put in, in Ham when I was in Hamden, we put in years before we did this, um, we were way below our our levels based mostly because of deed restriction, but we require 20% affordability on anything more than five units. Now, at the time that was, um, you know, that was a big move and, um, you know, probably needs to be revisited, but that is, that's where you get your, your affordability, your ability to, really enforce affordability. You need the supply in order to be able to enforce affordability. And that's where, the, um, whether it's form-based code or anything else, that's where adding supply comes in. So I think we really need to look at this as, and, and the gentleman before spoke about um, septic systems and such. We really need to look at a lot of these things as sort of a Venn diagram it take you know things need to comply with health code do we need to look at the health code do we need to look at the building code um, and make changes there to make these things happen um, the other thing is how do we look at these things in if we look at them as the smart code does as the transect that covers all the types of um population levels and um, types of housing. If we start ruling out, you know, rural housing or um, making it difficult to have rural space, that's a problem both environmentally, socially, politically, we're dead in the water. Um, so the idea that you can accommodate all types of housing types, um, I think is really important. You can't have dense, you know, walkable cities without having open space somewhere else. You got to make the oxygen somewhere. So looking at it as a transect, I think is helpful. Um, and I'll stop there. Yeah, really. You're, thank you, Leslie. And, and great work in, in Hamden. I'll just, the two points I'll make on that. First, 100% agree. Hold, 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 hold on. Hold on a second. I, uh, so Pete, just say, say after this comment, I think we should move to Francis's um, presentation and then come back at the end with more questions and answers. So Ma Matthew, uh, Emmeline, um, we'll come back to your, to your whatever questions you have um, at, uh, at the end. And, um, and I just also wanna say that as far as I'm concerned, unless I hear differently from my co-chair and or uh, the people in the legislature, our charge is defined by statute, and 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 I, I think we need to stay within that. I don't, you know, building codes and other kinds of things are. We're not talking about changing building codes or or any other things that we're we're defined by what's being asked in statute, in my opinion. Anyhow, Francis, uh, Pete, uh, if you could um, answer, and uh, then we'll move on to to Francis's uh, presentation. Yeah, I'll just say very quickly. Appreciate it, Leslie, and we. I think this is one part of the toolkit one part of the conversation for sustainability, affordability. Uh, and, I, and again, I think I appreciate David, like narrowing in on that, I think is helpful in figuring out what tools kit, what we can provide to the toolkit, but happy to have a conversation after. Thank you. Um, Francis, are you ready to 
make your presentation regarding yes. streets? Let me just share the correct window. Aha. It is, oh, wrong button. Uh -huh. We got that. Okay. Um, yeah, so here's my presentation on neighborhood street design guidelines. And this is actually a, a section of Public Act 2129 that, you know, I can't trace the provenance, but this was actually a suggestion that came from West Cog, and we were glad to see it incorporated in the bill. So under Public Act 2129, we have our charge, which includes creating a design manual for context appropriate streets to complement common building types. Now, there are existing uh, design manuals out there. Uh, these include the Connecticut Highway Design Manual and the uh, CONDOT's Guidelines for Subdivision Streets, as well as uh, a couple of design manuals from Ashtow. Now, the challenge here is that the design Connecticut Highway Design Manual is primarily intended for streets that serve a purpose of moving traffic, not providing access to residences. And it really is not designed for neighborhoods. It's designed for higher volume roads, for collectors, arterials, freeways. Uh, in response to this, uh, I could say mismatch, the General Assembly commissioned guidelines for subdivision streets in 1983. They were released in 1987, and they were intended to provide an alternate set of designs for neighborhood streets. Um, however, as far as I can tell, they were never used, at least have not been used widely, and they are relatively out of date. Oh, sorry, duplicate slides. Um, so, and then of course, uh, Ashto, the federal body has released recommendations for low volume local roads. Those have not been uh, implemented in Connecticut. So that's what we're looking at right now. A couple of state design manuals that don't really get us where we want to be and a federal manual that hasn't uh, been implemented here. Now, when we're talking about streets, the question is why are we talking about they have a lot of impacts. First and foremost in building a neighborhood is cost. So uh, in preparation for this presentation, I had uh, our engineer cost out three hypothetical streets. Uh, one is a highly engineered subdivision. This is actually based off the design standards in use in the Connecticut municipality. A second is a conventional subdivision, which is used by many uh, municipalities of Connecticut, variations thereof. And third is what I would term a private neighborhood. So if you uh, uh, travel throughout Connecticut, you'll see different types of streets. Um, and if you end up in uh, Western Connecticut, you'll see a number of private streets or uh, private roads into neighborhoods. Many of these roads are very narrow. They may have slalom gates you have to drive around. They're designed very differently than what we see in other places. So if you look at this chart in front of you, and apologies for all the numbers, it's the bottom line that matters. This is a street of 1,000 feet long. Uh, that would be uh, 10 homes on one acre lots, could be five homes on two acre lots. It depends upon the soil types and infrastructure in place. But the bottom line is the high uh, design, which is a highly engineered subdivision, the cost for that street is almost $900,000. The cost for the conventional subdivision, which other towns use, is $300,000. And the cost for the private neighborhood, which is often a higher end neighborhood, is $55,000. And what we've seen is that these design standards are, um, they don't scale proportionally with the cost of the homes in a neighborhood. In fact, they often scale inversely proportionally. So if you're building 10 homes in a highly engineered subdivision, you're talking about $87,000 upcharge per home solely for the street including sidewalk, lighting, curbs, so on and so forth. We're not getting into uh, uh, public water, public sewer here, any of that infrastructure, just looking at the actual street. So these street design guidelines, which are not part of zoning, but are very important and are in 2129, have a major impact on housing affordability. Now they also have an impact on environments. If we look at these three streets, the conventional uh, subdivision street generates 0.74 million gallons of runoff per year. The higher end subdivision, the private road is 0.44 million and the, uh, the highly engineered subdivision is 1.24 million, which is almost three times what the, you could say less designed road costs. Now we also see that this extra asphalt uh, creates higher summer temperatures so the urban heat island effect. It requires more maintenance, not just for plowing, but pre-icing and de-icing, which runs off and uh, pollutes our watersheds, leads to salinification of groundwater. And this asphalt also in its lifespan yes. releases more greenhouse gas emissions through its uh, manufacture and its installation. 
Um, perhaps most concerningly are the safety impacts of street design. Now, the wider, flatter, and straighter you build a road, the faster drivers tend to drive. And this chart shows it's not a perfect correlation, but there is a trend line there. I'm sure all of you who drive are familiar when the road is nice and flat and straight, has no potholes, no curves, good sight lines, you naturally drive faster because you feel comfortable. These are what we call self-enforcing speed limits. However, it's not just the speed that's the problem here. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the result of the speed. When you drive faster, you have uh, your, your vehicle travels and more distance that you would be able to react during. Your reaction time stays the same, but your vehicle travels more distance and the risk of crash increases. In addition to the increased risk of crash, the impacts of the crash go up too. So this chart shows you uh, the probability of a fatality for impacts between um, a pedestrian, cyclist, and a vehicle. If you look at the chart, the red line, now this isn't kilometers an hour, um, the probability of fatality is very low until you get to about 30 kilometers an hour, which is 18 uh, miles an hour. And uh, Emily, and I saw you raised a hand. I think I'll, I'll get you in a bit, if that's okay. Um, when we look at streets in, in, in Connecticut, uh, we don't design streets for 18 miles an hour. We design streets for 25, 30, 35, 40 miles an hour. Uh, even cul-de-sacs are designed for relatively high speeds. Now, here are some examples of what streets in Connecticut look like. If you look at this street here, you can see the houses in the center. You see a three-home cul-de-sac, which is a lot of asphalt for what is essentially uh, a, a grandiose shared driveway. It's a lot of asphalt, a lot of runoff. Now, these are large homes. This is in Farmington, but this street is expensive to build. Not just the street, but also the sidewalk around it. And the homeowners, I'm sure, are delighted to have to shovel a sidewalk that nobody will ever walk on. What's interesting here is if you look at the main road, there's no sidewalk on the main road. So we are putting sidewalks with our current uh, designs in places where there is very little traffic and not where there's a lot of traffic. Um, moving on, here's another example in another town. This street here is uh, 35 feet wide, the asphalt. Keep in mind, the car is about six and a half feet wide. Here's what it looks like when you're actually traveling down it. This is a neighborhood street. Again, these may not be affordable homes. They are larger homes. But this is a very expensive street to build. And these are the standards that a lot of municipalities are using. We are building a lot of infrastructure at great cost to developers and, and homeowners with great environmental and safety impacts and unclear public benefit. Now, here's an example of a historic street in Connecticut. Um, I chose this street because it functions fine. It's not unsafe. There's no record of accidents there. Now, it's a more rural context, although it's in a city. What's interesting about it is if you travel down the street, it turns into this. This is the beginning of the street. This is the end of the street, a cul-de-sac. And look at those cars on the street. This is not in a high-income community. This is actually a relatively low-income municipality. And it was very high property taxes, I should, I should add. And look at how much asphalt is being laid down there. Uh, here's the street I just mentioned. You can see uh, where the playing fields are. And north of it is the first section I showed. Uh, then you can see the cul-de-sac, how large that is. Right next to that is I-84. So the cul-de-sac is more similar in size to I-84 than it is to the historic street, even though I-84 carries much higher volumes of traffic at much higher speeds. Now for a contrast, here are the, um, this street right here, going back to it, that's 38 feet wide under local standards. This is another community in Connecticut. Uh, again, this is a higher income part of a community that itself is not high income. These streets are 14, 15 feet wide. Uh, similar density on, on a, a larger basis, um, but there's no record of crashes here. Houses are not burning down. Emergency vehicles can still access the properties. Uh, and then last but not least, here's an example of uh, my hometown in Connecticut. This is a collector. This road is not a dead end. It's a road that carries a good amount of traffic. I've measured the tape measure at 16 feet wide. And in fact, Google Street View came up on some road maintenance. And uh, turns out the Street View car can creep by in 16 feet. Uh, you don't need 38 feet. So those are examples in Connecticut and they're predominantly suburban, exurban examples because that's what most of our built environment is. And that's where we expect most people in the future to live. So we do have to think about that. Urban is very important, but so is suburban and exurban. Here are a couple of examples from Europe showing a more urban context where you have what's called shared space. 
um, much uh, less engineered road design standards that dramatically reduce the cost of housing, reduce the cost of development, provide environmental benefits, provide safety benefits, and contribute more to a sense of community. Again, another example, this one is uh, in, in, in Germany. This one is also in Germany where I used to live. So that takes us to where we're kind of, we, we are right now. Uh, I work at the Western Connecticut Council of Governments. Uh, our largest funding source is the Federal Highway Administration. We do transportation planning. And I was very honored to be put onto this commission and uh, this working group. And what we're working on right now, and I think would uh, kind of dovetail right into what this working group is working on, is looking at developing uh, design guidelines that are appropriate for neighborhood streets. So what we're thinking about right now is a proposal that would be neighborhood streets based on objective information and best practices that applies to low volume streets. So under 40 miles an hour, probably a lot less than that, and also access roads and driveways. And we're gonna consider all users, environmental sustainability, the cost of construction and maintenance, community cohesion, land use, and utilities. Uh, what we're thinking about looking at um, is not just what we've done in Connecticut recently, but what best practices are nationally and internationally. So living streets, play streets, um, looking at how we uh, fold sustainability into our streets. So minimize the urban heat island effects, surface runoff, uh, noise pollution, uh, improve safety, and also really deliver uh, infrastructure that's much more cost effective for our developers and our home buyers which includes renters. Um, this is not a street we would propose. This is a very different context, but Power PowerPoint put it in there. Um, what goes into a street is actually very complicated. The, the, the long list on the side of the slide shows all the factors that go into street design. We all know what a nice street is, but to actually tell an engineer how to build it, they need a lot of specifications. So these are proposed by our, our, our resident transportation engineer, but of course we are open to other uh, additions and modifications. Uh, the use of this design guideline, obviously we have a statutory mandate here to fulfill, but you know, we, we of those who are planners are, you know, we, we hear about plans that are frequently shelved. We don't want that to happen. Uh, we really wanna provide, unlike the 1987 subdivision guidelines, uh, guidelines for subdivision streets, we really want these guidelines to be used. Uh, a drop-in replacement for federal and state guidelines when a municipality so chooses and be created in such a way that municipalities are comfortable using them, that they aren't afraid there'll be a increased liability associated with them. So here's my last slide. I've talked a lot. Um, this is the process. Um, we know that commissions like this struggle with getting the work done because we are all volunteers on this commission. Um, the nice part is some of us come to this with a, a professional backing. Um, the Western Connecticut Council of Governments does receive federal funding for transportation planning. This is an eligible activity. Um, I have had this approved by my board. Uh, we've prepared a bid document that's under review. Uh, once that is approved, and if there may be some modifications, then we'd go out to bid, uh, go through a selection process with consultants and produce a document, um, hopefully in conjunction with this working group that this working group can supply. Um, but they can also be put into practice, put into use by municipalities. So in a nutshell, on a lot of words, that's where we are on street design guidelines. And I'm happy to answer any questions, although I know there were some reserved for Pete too. So uh, whenever uh, the time is right, I'll take my questions. So, so we can, I think, take a few minutes like we did before um, and answer questions specific to this. Um, and, and then um, I don't want to lose track of the time. I would like to speak toward the sub, sub working groups that we could convene to talk about uh, breaking down the, 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 the charge to, the, to, the, to, this, to this working group. And um, so let's, let's take a few minutes. So Emily, your, your hand is raised. I guess, um, so I'm, I'm, Francis, thank you. I think you're gonna to end up with a fight with the public safety people. Oh my gosh, I could even imagine my fire marshal. I could hear my fire marshal's uh, voice in my head right now. Ah, <laughs> the fire trucks can't make it. They can't turn around. Um, anyway, but um, I, guess, I guess my question is in terms of the, so if we're doing this, I mean, I guess my, and I have to go back to the statute because my understanding was you know, we're really trying to, to figure out ways in which to help because 
again, my, my whole thought with this is, you know, we've got 90% of our land area zoned for single family residential, right? So I, I think that what my understanding was we need to figure out how to provide what isn't provided um, a bit in terms of, um, you know, design solutions that I think other communities struggle with, which might be infill to add more diversified housing choices. So for me, like when, when I look at, I think what you presented absolutely makes sense in terms of cost for developments and how that decreases affordability. I just, I just wonder when we're looking at um, who this housing targets in terms of, you know, folks who might not have cars, who might have to choose alternative modes of transportation. Um, I think sidewalks are really important. Um, so I just don't know how to marry my concerns with what I absolutely agree with you in terms of looking at the actual dollars and cents. Um, so just wanted to put that out there. Thanks. Thanks, Emily. That's, you know, that's some really good points. And I, I hear where you're coming from and I agree. I think this kind of get back, gets back to Bob's point about the different, you know, urban, suburban, rural contexts we have. And one way to deliver more affordable housing is building it in areas where you don't need a car. Absolutely. You can save 20% of your income there and build it where you have public infrastructure. You can save all the super expensive well and septic um, and put people closer to jobs. But the reality is that, you know, Connecticut will continue to be majority suburban in the future. Um, and we do need to accommodate affordable housing in all environments. Um, there's been a lot of work done looking at urban road design, uh, not so much at suburban neighborhoods or exurban neighborhoods. And if you look at how roads are actually built, arguably we are over designing the lowest volume roads. I would not say we're necessarily over designing urban roads. Uh, they get a lot of attention and space is very constrained. Um, so, but I hear what you're saying and I do think we need to look at roads in all different contexts. And with respect to the sidewalks, Absolutely, sidewalks. If you best practice, if you look at uh, European countries, nor at least Western Europe, the way they handle it is they they determine where a sidewalk goes based upon certain criteria. Uh, what's the the volume of cars in the road? What's the width of the road? What's the speed of the road? Uh, we don't have any such criteria <laughs> for sidewalks in this country. It's essentially the town has a regulation: sidewalks must go on all new roads, which is is not a rational use of resources. And it's actually one reason why we uh, advocate for a payment in lieu of sidewalks. A legislative change, which is used in many other states very successfully. But we can talk about that later. Thank you. So Frank, you have your hand up. So part of the challenge I have is our community is a very small XXX urban community. 1800 residential structures in town, no public water, no public sewer, no public transportation. So all of this stuff sounds very interesting, but to put a 35 foot wide road with a sidewalk. I mean, there are no sidewalks in town. Most of the roads don't even have curves. So all this is, is a significant impact on a small community. Uh, Frank, I think um, we are not advocating 35 foot roads. That was an example of a road that is, is overbuilt. So I, I agree with you. No, I, I understand they weren't advocating that, but but just, I mean, we have people who live in our town who are on dirt roads who every time the town even comes close to considering paving it, they are up in arms because it keeps traffic off their street. And there are people who want to turn paved roads into dirt roads to keep traffic off their street. We have a 25 mile an hour, nice, long, straight section of road that people regularly drive 55 miles an hour on. We'd keep the cops there all day long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just slowing traffic down on a three quarter mile section of roadway. So it, we need to consider traffic calming. We need to consider narrower, windier roads and forget about it's really cool to have a nice long straight road. I, you know, I'm, I'm all for the creativity of, of, of a different road design uh, and, and to see what comes out of this this discussion. I, I also have a, a question for you, Francis, for a second. This is like looking into the future and looking into 
the likelihood of autonomous vehicles and 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 ride sharing. And when you started thinking about road standards, do we do, is is it are planners thinking about that future impact? Yes, we discuss it a lot, um, but some of the euphoria has worn off. So I think we're focused a lot more on electrification now. That's just a, a technological change. Uh, autonomous vehicles, the artificial intelligence is not there yet. And I don't expect to see it there for 20 or 30 years. When it does happen, the places it will first be rolled out will not be Connecticut. They will be climates that have no snow, little rain, the roads don't heave, the roads are straight, they are well-maintained. It'll be Nevada, and there'll probably be autonomous vehicle lanes on the interstates. I think the um, complicated historic environments we have, uh, where they're very mixed, a lot of urban, dense, confusing places, will be the last places we see full autonomy. Good to hear that it's a consideration. I, I think you're wrong about the 20 years, but we'll see, I guess. Um, uh, Leslie, la last question, and then we'll ta start talking about subgroups and then come back to question and answers with any time we have left. Um, just a couple of things. One is um, Dave Dixon at Stantec has been doing a lot of research on autonomous vehicles. Um, if anybody wants his contact, if you don't have it, just get in touch with me. Um, he's, he has been at the forefront of that. Um, and the other thing is, I think Emmeline raised a really good point about fire trucks. One of the issues is that if we are, I have often referred to design by fire truck, which is a ridiculous way to design. It doesn't mean that we don't need to allow for emergency vehicles, but we'll met, these fire trucks keep getting bigger and bigger. Fewer people die of heart attacks and other medical conditions in Europe where the streets are much narrower, the Emergency vehicles are basically the size of a VW van and um, are actually much easier to maneuver. I think we need to start again, having conversations with emergency services. I understand what kind of an uphill battle that is. Dan Baisden, um has done this, has done a number of studies. This is his area of expertise. And um, I recommend uh, Googling his work um, or contacting him. I am at only one degree of separation away from his contacts if I don't have it already. Um, so anyway, these should, yes, they're, they're challenges, but they are not insurmountable and other people have been working on these. Thank, thank you, Leslie. And I, I think, you know, if we start thinking about like down the road uh, outcomes for this committee, uh, I believe that we can, um, we can have suggestions of things that, that the legislature should look at that would complement what we're doing. I would then, but I, I certainly don't want to make part of our group uh, the, the getting buy-in from, from the, the emergency responders because I, I don't think... Uh, I, don't think I totally get, agree with you. Yeah, but um, we, but I think having those suggestions would be would be great. I don't understand personally why every time there's an accident, there's three ladder trucks that show up or something. You know, um, uh, but we need. But I think it's important to understand where we're going to get pushback and where we're not. Even if understand. it isn't within, I understand your concern about keeping this within the narrow-ish constraints of the legislation. And, and I'm all for that, but we need to understand what else impacts it. I, I, um, I agree with you. And I think we can, we can raise all of those. We're uh, smart. We can do this. <laughs> we can, uh, yeah, well, we can consider what needs to be considered and then write what we need to write. Agreed. Um, Representative Zulo, do you have anything you'd like to add at this point uh, uh, based on the discussions here? I actually thought that your autonomous vehicle comment was was enlightening. I was thinking the same thing, but I'll, I'll also just note that suggestions are welcome. I mean, you, a lot of times we get these reports and these documents and there isn't a whole lot of color to them. You know, a lot more takes place in these in, in these working groups than what actually ends up making it into the documents and into the recommendations that meet, you know, that get to us. So even if they're not things that get fully uh, hashed out the fact that if there's if there's a little bit more color that comes to the final document that, that we get it's actually very helpful so I would be on board with that and I apologize for my camera if it's breaking up I'm having some problems today 
Um, so in, in, in some offline discussions that I had in getting ready for this meeting, and I believe it was, uh, I think Francis, you made the, 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 the comment about, about developing subgroups with people's particular expertise, um, uh, thinking, thinking about the, the sort of the, the five parts of the, of our charge, um, there's, you know, identify common architectural and site design features of building types used throughout Connecticut is number one. Number two, create a catalog of common building types, particularly those typically associated with housing. Three, establish reasonable and cost-effective design review standards for approval of common building types, accounting for topography, geology, climate change, infrastructure capacity. Four, establish procedures for expediting the approval of building of streets that satisfy these design review standards, um, whether for zoning or subdivision regulations. And then five, create a design manual for context appropriate streets that complement common building types. So if, looking at those, it seemed to be that one and two might be a sub working group, three and four might be a sub working group, and then five is its own sub working group. So I, I just maybe just open it up for discussion about that. And then I think the idea would be to get our, our working group to uh, identify group or groups that they would like to um, participate in, um, ultimately define sort of sub chairs of those groups and, 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 um, and, then, and then looking forward at our, at our future meetings, being able to bring those groups in to start uh, reporting back. So any, any thoughts on this? None. I'll chime in and say, I think it's a good idea. I, I don't know how we would want to a portion that up though. I mean, obviously on a volunteer basis and then not, you don't want groups to get so big that they're unwieldy. You know, so some of us may end up in groups where we may not be perfect fit, but obviously there are a couple of people here who, who have who have working knowledge in areas that, that would be helpful in those areas. So um, just great. great thought. Fr frankly, I, I couldn't discern the difference between some of those uh, verbally. I think I'd have to see them written down to look at them to decide which one I might be able to help because they're, they're so, a little the nuances between them I, I couldn't figure out. Matthew, they they would have been in one of the 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 last email I sent you had that had the charge in it. Uh, I, I try to include it uh, often uh, in the because it is it is what we're we're charged with. But uh, Frank, and I've also put it in the um, chat. I just put it in the chat for everyone. Thank so you, Ashley. Also. Yeah, Frank. I'd be more than interested in working on anything that tries to figure out how you put some of this stuff into zoning regulations. So the, I was the, vice, that's three and vice four. chair of zoning in Marlboro for two years, vice and chairman of zoning in Reading for 30 years, and trying to take some of the state stuff that is designed for Hartford, New Haven, Stanford, it's the bigger cities, and squeeze it into a town of 6,000 people is a challenge. Thank you, uh, Emily. I was just going to say that um, I, I think I, I mean I think the subcommittees are a good idea, but I think what we need to do is we need to kind of establish the framework first within the specific items that we're looking at. So, you know, uh, village size environments, rural sized environments. Like we, I think we have to categorize that first before we break apart, and then I think we need somebody to be kind of checking in on each of the groups to make sure that we're not doing repetitive things, that we are really kind of taking whatever those subcommittees are and, and working working on something that's going, that are, that's going to be kind of obviously very interconnected with each other, but distinctly different. So we're not all doing the same exact thing. Agreed. I, the, the idea of looking at the five things is like the first two are kind of more like sort of like on the, 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 the model, the model, um, the model code issue three and four are sort of implementation for towns. For, so it's more of a legal kind of a construct. And five is also on the design, sort of the model side, but specific to streets. That was the 
that was the way it, it broke down for me. I don't disagree that there needs to be coordination. They can't be working in silos without, without um, cross discussion, so. Can I suggest that we have, um, that we, that you send out an email with, um, you know, one, two, and three with, um, I know, I know you sent this. Yes, no, I will do, I will do that subsequent uh, to this meeting. So, but let people volunteer for where they think they fit best or of with course. most. Yes. And then yeah. see if those, um, groups are balanced in terms of expertise, numbers, uh, and whatever. Um, and then have them, have each of those groups sort of put together an outline of um, their path. And then as Emline, I think, um, was, is absolutely right, suggested have, uh, David, I think it's gonna be you, um, follow up with each group and make one, make sure that everybody's meeting and number two, um, that any uh, crossover or duplication of efforts um, either gets redirected in a constructive way or, um, you know, or sort of taken off one group's plate. Uh, and then let's see where we end up. You know, let's, let's have a timeline with uh, milestones and deadlines and, um, See what happens. Yeah, thank you. I will. Um, subsequent to this meeting, I'll, I will put out a, a request of for interest. I, I, I actually, um, you know, but I have to speak with my co-chair and 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 with the uh, the folks from uh, from the legislature as well. So, um, uh, Bob, please. Yes. Uh, just two things. So, when I'm looking at this again, does this also pertain to what I call existing buildings and new buildings? It's both. It's, it doesn't seem to differentiate, right? So you have a big old factory that's rusting somewhere that it seems to be a popular place to put housing. You know, should we address that um, right. from there? And then also at least I bring up how would something like, you know, my own belief would be, which Connecticut has not been a leader on is tiny homes. Uh, I just, came across this really progressive area in Texas. It's called Dallas of all places. They have Lake Dallas Tiny Home Village. And there seems to be municipalities utilizing actual little tiny homes to try to solve homeless issues, veterans issues, and affordability issues. And millennials seem to be in love with it. I have a friend who lives in a van and he's a doctor at Yale. I, so, yeah. I I don't have a, an answer for that one way or the other. I mean, I think it's- right. uh, Well, I sort of bring up the, the, the we've had discussion about what Francis brought up is really with, uh, with new construction, right? You've got this open field, you're gonna come in and we roads and we can address that issue there. But a lot of Connecticut is built already, right? So, so what else mentioned about filling in about it. And, and then I bring up the tidy house thing, because for me at least, I look at the intent of what I'm reading into and I, I would defer to the good representative what you wanna to get to, but I really think that there's certain communities where tiny homes, where they have septic and water, especially you know, in, uh, uh, in that community could make a sense. Here's, we got an acre and a half. Oh my gosh, hey, we could have a dozen tiny homes here. Um, I, I don't know, Pete, maybe I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, given your background in in the issues, I'm um, particularly uh, particularly about existing structure, existing factories, as an example, uh, uh, the repurposing of those. I, I'm not sure. Does that f it, 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 we're getting into that sort of as of right question, and it's a change um, of use. So it's it's it's. It, I'm not sure where what we're trying to do in terms of those. Issues. Yeah, I mean. There's certainly in the Collinsville example, or plan is an example of this as well. Um, I mean, it, just in the broader sense, I think my understanding is this is really a working group in the legislature, legislature designated this to be about how do we infill, uh, how do we prioritize getting more out of existing infrastructure, lessening the impact. Um, so, and 
that's, you know, like repurposing industrial uses and commercial spaces and retail spaces is part of a form-based code approach and certainly outside of that too. I mean, those both those things can both exist, but I would imagine as we explore form-based codes, like we'll see through these plans and Leslie probably knows in Hamden um, a lot better than I do, like that's part of the conversation. So I don't, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure if it's, um, uniquely different than what, how we'd be talking about form-based use anyway. So I think that falls within line of what we're doing. Um, but the broader point I think to highlight is the focus really needs to be on how do we figure out smart ways to do that kind of infill repurposing, uh, and, and protecting our sort of existing green spaces. So that's, I see a part of it for sure. I don't know if that really, that might've been rambling, but. Oh, but thank you. Emmeline, your hands up. I, I tend to agree. I mean, I think, um, you know, I mean, having watched a good part of the legislation, <laughs> the legislature kind of in the planning and development committee kind of work through, I think some of the, some of the bills that went through a couple of years ago, and even this past year, you know, there's, there's a lot of sensitivity about, you know, please don't tell us about what we're already doing. I think there's definitely a sense for uh, sensitivity about what folks already know how to do. I think, you know, our task, if we read between the lines, is to help communities with those things that they're just not that familiar with, which is the infill development, you know, adding different types of units beyond what they already have within their communities that help address those housing need issues that we're really kind of feeling the pressure of, which is, you know, um, seniors who can't afford to age in their larger homes, they need to downsize to something, but there's not a lot of option within their communities. Um, so I think we can think about that thoughtfully and, and in a diversified way, like the tiny home example that, that um, Rob provided, or whether it's converting these buildings in our communities that had prior uh, viability, that, but that now might be able to be used for something else. And I think because we have such a diverse array of communities with, you know, not a lot of planning capacity that we are, are implied in the statute, I think our task is to help provide some of that capacity. So that that's just, you know. Thank you. Matthew. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's time to go back to the original question and discussion. Uh, on form-based code, but I think that's something that, that Robert brought up originally is how much affordability is created by form-based code. The answer is zero, unless there's inclusionary zoning associated with it. If you have a, an affluent community, you can build hundreds and hundreds of units and not a single one will be affordable, unless you mandate that that's the case. And when you're doing it, let's such as a Westport has 20% of uh, inclusionary zoning. So it's a four to one relationship. So for every one affordable, you're building five or four uh, market rate units. Now you're changing the complete structure of a community by achieving the affordability that we're after. And that's the whole goal is how do we do that? And I think someone said before, we're supposed to be explaining to communities, if you want to build affordability, here are the different ways to do it. And I also sit on the subcommittee for affordable housing. We're creating the the guide for it. And again, we're running against this, the same concepts. Uh, you know, in that one, uh, some people were completely indicting the communities for not doing it. But the point is, it's like, okay, that's the past. Everybody's mandated to figure out a way to do it. So what's the best way to do it? So form-based code works very well on an empty slate. So if you have an open project, or if you have urban renewal, or if you have an old warehouse that you want to change, or if you have some kind of industrial area, or even a commercial area you want to change. But how are you going to convince the residents of the community, Pete said that you need to get the buy-in from the community if they don't want to do it. If you have the residential homes on single acres and say to them, hey guys, we're going to put in form-based code and everybody says no, which is probably what's going to occur. Then how do you do the form-based code? I mean, so form-based code is, is basically what we're saying and from what I was reading was it's an offer to the communities not a mandate to the communities. The best way to achieve it, saying here, you can try it in these areas. So if you've got an area where we're hearing, it's like, we want more walkable. We don't need to have as much parking. Well, that's all fine and good in a utopian world, 
But when everything else that these people have to do, go to schools, go to the baseball fields, go shopping, and all these other things that aren't in this little walkable community that's created by a form-based code, it doesn't work. So we need to explain to people when we're doing form-based code, this is really what you're doing in this area. Because unless we do form-based code everywhere and we urbanize all the small towns, no one's going to be able to get around because they won't have cars. And it can walk there, but it's going to be miles to do it with sidewalks. So there's a, a mix between what we need to be doing to get communities to buy in and what the reality of the situation is in the end. Because ultimately, the aesthetic of Connecticut, I think that's what, what Francis is talking about, is that single acre zoning or a single family zoning and communities is where what exists. And it's probably going to stay for a long time. We need to figure out how to entice communities to build affordable housing in a form-based code. Is it say here, you can do it here and you can do it here and you can do it here, but it's not going to be able to be happening throughout all the towns. So I think that's part of our charge is to entice the communities, giving them a, a, a concept to have them want to buy in. So that's sort of where I'm at. Thank you, Sean. You. Oh. I'll try to limit my comments to what I was why I originally raised my hand. But first, I just want to say that I don't think this group or or uh, is here to talk about what the aesthetic of Connecticut is, and it is certainly not, in my personal view, one acre zoning. So that's not why I'm here. And uh, any product that claims that it is is something that I'll fight vigorously. Second, I just want to clarify: affordability is more than deed restricted housing. And there's a lot the state can do to increase affordability. There's a lot that municipalities can do to increase affordability. That's much more beyond deed restrictions. For instance, allowing lower cost housing, as in small single family homes on small lots, really something, you know, Rob mentioned tiny homes. Well, let's go back to where we were not very long ago and talk about smaller homes on smaller pieces of land that are inherently less expensive. Now, when you're talking about affordability, those types of homes are homes in which folks with single family mortgages from Connecticut Housing Finance Authority that are included if, if many towns are very, very focused on A30G. Those, those types of mortgages qualify towards uh, your affordability uh, percentages. Those homes don't no longer exist in many towns. And when they do, they catch a premium now because there are so few of them, including my hometown my, uh, of Waterbury, which has seen rates of 30% or more increases in property values over the last year because those small little ranches do not get built. They haven't been built since the 50s and 60s. Why don't we start there? And uh, so I just want to clarify that um, and then we're, you know, we've often talked, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about capital A affordability versus small A affordability. Well, the whole state is not um, lower Fairfield County. And I just want to say that now. And we need to figure out how to accommodate um, moderate income families and lower income families to have the same opportunities that many of us on this call had to, to, to have homeownership opportunities if they want them, and if not, to live affordably. And that to me is what the, the char why I am on this group. And I don't want to, I have no interest in arguing further, and I'm not going to, I won't bring it up again. The aesthetic of Connecticut is not what I'm here for. I'm here to figure out how to get the state to prosper by lowering our housing costs. I think to a degree, that's why we're all here, Sean. So thank you. Um, I don't see, I mean, again, I think it's up to the, to the, the broader group, but I never envisioned this was gonna be a, uh, that we'd be developing a pattern book for design. Yeah, for, for a lot of different reasons. Some of the reasons that Leslie had expressed and, you know, you, you wanna allow creativity, you know, I, I always saw this as more of a, a, a volumetric discussion, if anything, in terms of what we're talking about for forms, not uh, specifics, but anyhow. Um, but thank you for your comments. Uh, Leslie, you're, you're up next, I believe. I just want to, um, one thing about, for, I think form-based code is 
grossly misunderstood. Um, and we really need, uh, Pete did a great job of explaining it, but I know from experience that it needs to be explained over and over and over again. Um, one of the things about form-based code is it can be used anywhere. It can be used anything from, you know, a, a cemetery or a farm to Philadelphia. And um, the key to it is that it gets calibrated for the local condition. And I can't stress those words enough. So this idea that, you know, we can't do this in rural areas or we can't do this in infill or can only be infill, um, that's just not what form based, that's not using form based code to its maximum level. So, um, and the other thing is, it, the legislation does not specify form based code. And while I am an advocate of form based code, what I really am an advocate of is hybrid codes because I don't believe that things, you know, it's a one size fits all. Um, kind of world. So that goes to the calibration point. Okay, I'm gonna stop, I have no voice. Ben. Thank you. Yeah, I, I did. Um, and I, I was on the phone earlier, um, which makes Zoom is not really built for. So I actually uh, heard most of the presentation on the form-based code and I do wanna watch a copy of it again, um, because I think that, um, you know, my understanding um, of sort of our charge is, um, and sort of to, to Sean's point, I think the goal is that um, what Sean said, um, and I think that the, the issue is to do it with a lighter hand in terms of this is not a mandate, but to try to help towns get to that point. Um, I mean, so I'm West Hartford Town Council, we are the zoning authority, and frankly, except for one of the original 830G uh, cases, uh, 30 years ago, you know, we haven't had the issue because we've really recently been approving everything. And our problem is we don't have developers coming, uh, coming in with plans to, to uh, reject or approve um, with sufficient affordable housing, you know, big A affordable housing um, and uh, like more. Uh, so some of that discussion kind of is great. Come, come to us with that. And again, I don't think you'll need the law with a good plan. But I think that one of the limitations is that, you know, we do sort of have a zoning re regime set up on uh, special development districts is how we do things here. And the result is it's just really expensive to develop here. And to the extent that we can come up with a model that helps, that we can adopt, that helps, the, you know, our zoning office just do that legwork and have a plan in place for as of right or close to as of right building, that's gonna help us develop you know, more, more housing. Um, and again, I think part of the limitations is just, a, you know, we're all, we all have municipal budgets based on you know, an outdated tax system and don't necessarily have the resources to do the kind of work needed to create new codes that'll work. So, I, you know, I think from, my point of view, I'm looking to see, you know, sort of as much off the shelf, uh, more progressive codes that we can adopt um, without having to do sort of a, as much spending as we normally would to, to study it all and, and come up with the right, right approach. So uh, that seems to me one of the major charges of, of this committee. Again, and I get that some places won't want to use it, and that's Sort of for a different legislation for a different day to whether there have to be mandates but at this point again i think it's just about helping those towns who wanted to look at other types of codes and i, I think especially form based would, is what would be really helpful thank you ben that is also sort of my general understanding of what our charge is here is but um caitlin i think you're going to be uh get final final comments here before we sort of talk about next steps Okay, thanks. Uh, no pressure. Um, I actually just wanted to second uh, what Leslie had said as far as, you know, form-based code being done anywhere. And and I will admit when I say form-based code, I'm also thinking hybrid. Again, my experience with Hartford, it's commonly referred to as a form-based code because it is, but it, it's a hybrid. We have a, a use table in there still. Um, but seconding her comment on the fact that it can be done anywhere, and it really is just a matter of calibration. Um, and 
particularly, I think I'm interested in the, the cataloging of the common building types in Connecticut. And it's, I feel like in conversation and, and maybe even in part, um, Pete, you did this on purpose, no, no mention or, you know, representation of Hartford's form-based code in there, I don't think, because I think people automatically assume like, well, that's Hartford and that's urban, but there are building types in that code that would be applicable in all towns. We have, you know, there's smaller houses, um, ranches and cave styles that they're applicable. It, it, again, is just a matter of that calibration. Um, and so, you know, I see one of our end results potentially being, you know, calibration recommendations for the various contexts, you know, that house type A, quote unquote, in Hartford, that's, you know, a ranch or a cape, you can apply that in different calibration contexts for your rural, your suburban, your urban towns. Um, so, you know, and I think by being able to provide a catalog of those types, we would be able to take away some of the, the big lift involved in creating, you know, these form-based codes for communities um, because it is very daunting. And I can say with the Hartford experience, you know, I forget how many building types were ended up being identified. Maybe it's in the, the ballpark of like 15 or, or 17 or something like that. And that includes all of your, you know, your commercial, your mixed use style, your, you know, residential only kind of buildings. Um, but, you know, I think you'd be surprised you, you start out with a, a huge number because you, you know, you're trying to identify in, in all the possible housing types. But then when you really start distilling it down to, you know, what would be considered a cape or what would be considered, you know, a slightly larger home or what is a ranch um, or, you know, in Hartford, you know, like perfect six was an example of something very unique to Hartford. Um, you, you actually can start to really narrow it down. Um, so I don't know, I think we could really help our communities by providing that catalog. Um, yeah. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, I just wanted to uh, look back on our possible, well, our next, so Ashley, do you have any sense of, or, or Alex, I guess, if the other dates will, are, will hold, that is, um, we've tentatively identified in an earlier email, 527, 617, 78, and 729. I, Cause I just want to make it, you know, make sure that everyone is aware of those potentially. So, um, I would have to confirm with Will um, for scheduling purposes, but as far as I'm concerned, those dates should be fine. Um, everyone is available for the same time. So we're going to try to get out some kind of confirmation uh, uh, soon. So, um, so that people aren't surprised and I will follow up with the, sort of the uh, request for interest in, in, in sub-working groups and try to give some more thought um, into, into that process. Um, so anybody else with any, uh, Representative Zulo, uh, additional comments? Do we, we still have you here? No. Oh yes, we do, sorry. That's all right, I appreciate it. No, I'm just gonna, I wanted to follow up and say, I think the sooner we can kind of break off into those subgroups, I realize Maybe there just needs to be a little bit more thought into how they're going to be formulated. But once we can, we could actually get a little more work done. It's, it's hard to get so much done as a larger group. So the sooner thank the you. better on that. But thank you for that. And then a request uh, that if you could stay on the line after the at the end of the call, along with uh, uh, Ashley and Alex, just so we can, recon you know, talk about next steps as well. Um, any other questions? Final, final comments from anybody, last chance. That being the case, um, I you know, look forward to collaborating with everybody here and coming up with, uh, with uh, the work that's been asked of us. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, great meeting. Great. I, um, Either will you were referring to with the scheduling? Yes. Uh, I just want to make sure. Uh, so, what are the, the any dates should work for me? If they don't work for me, I can find someone else to cover. So, I don't think you have to worry about me. Um, the dates are five twenty-seven, five 